Did I spend enough time with my kids? Was I too hard on them? Was I hard enough? Do they know how much I love them? Do they know how proud I am of them? Did I prepare them enough? Did I not prepare them enough? Am I involved enough in their lives? Am I too involved? Am I trusting them enough? Am I teaching them what's right? Am I a good parent? Hey, I'm excited to get to be with you, to have my wife, and we are super excited that we get to come this evening as well and join with you all. Uh, our kids, they love coming. They love this church. Uh, in fact, our son, he was in first service and they texted us. They were like, you'll never believe what your son said. We were asking the kids, how can you get closer to God? And your son Creighton, he raised his hand. He was like, you can do a fast and then starve yourself so you die and then you'll be with God. And I'm like, oh, that one's mine. That one's mine. I'm teaching you how to parent. Are you kidding? <laughs> like it's trying to kill your own children. Get them saved and then get them as quickly as we can to Jesus. That's the plan. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to be with you all. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I actually uh, went on a trip. I was flying out for a wedding of a staff member who was getting married. And right before we were getting ready to fly out, uh, I was flying out with Lindsay and the kids. They were staying here. And I started to have those morbid thoughts that you have when you're getting ready to leave of like, what if happens if something happens to me? You know, does my wife know the passwords? Does, what, I want my kids to, you know, think I was a good parent. I want my wife to know that I loved her. There's so many things that have been unsaid, like all these thoughts that were running through my mind. And then there was one overwhelming thought that I was like, I have to say this to my wife. And so I went up to her right as I'm leaving. And I was like, Lindsay, if anything happens to me, I want you to promise that you will always water the lawn. You see, I'm a guy, I care about the lawn, okay? Do I have any yard guys out there? Any people where you're like, I am a yard aficionado? Like, I grew up in Kentucky, and it's called the blue grass state, okay? So we care about grass. I'm the guy that sits there, and I go, and I hand pick all the different weeds. Uh, literally, there was a kid in the neighborhood one time. They're like, how come you're always working in your yard? That's all we see you do. And I'm like, great, that's how I'm known as, is the guy who's just working in the yard. But, but I care about it. Like I literally, I just recently, I put a bunch of sand in the, law, in the yard to try to make it all level and like that golf course smooth because I want the perfect manicured lawn. I even had this new person in the neighborhood they moved in, and uh, I was telling them, oh, we just live right around the corner. And they're like, you're the one with the nice yard. And I'm like, yes, I've got people notice the yard. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that when I die eventually, my tombstone, my wife's just going to have it say, Jeremy White had a nice yard. Like, that's all, that's all I'm going to be known for. And white teeth, yard, nice yard and white teeth. Uh, you know, unlike Pastor Chad. Oh my goodness, can you imagine, like he's going to need a tombstone that's like 12 miles big just so they could write all the great things. And, and it's going to be something along the lines of Pastor Chad. It's not even going to have his last name because everyone knows who he is. Pastor Chad, follower of God, amazing husband, loved his kids, incredible pastor, rock hard abs. Like something, <laughs> some combination of all of that is going to be on that tombstone. Uh, but today... I really want to talk about what's the legacy that you're leaving? How are people going to remember you? And they say that an inheritance is what you leave for someone, but a legacy is what you leave in someone. 
What is it that you want to leave in your children? And not just in your children, in the next generation. I love that this is a church that is passionate and that one of your values is that you're pouring in and connecting and care about the next generation, that you're discipling them. Man, I love that about this church. I actually, uh, I was reading about uh, this pastor. His name was Jonathan Edwards. He was like one of the super pastors in the 1700s in early America, uh, right before the, the American Revolution. And he was this great revivalist. And as I was reading about his lineage, they did this study about him. And here's what they found. They measured, they looked at 729 of his descendants. And of these 729 descendants, 300 became preachers, 65 college professors, 13 university presidents, 60 authors, 3 U.S. congressmen, and 1 vice president. Wow. Like, I'm glad when my son gets a B. And this guy has this just legacy of his kids doing these things. And then they measured and they looked at this other guy in the same time period. And this guy, his name was, uh, was Max Jukes. He lived in the same city, like same area. He had 1,200 descendants. And of those 1,200, seven were murderers, 60 were thieves, 150 were convicts, 190 were prostitutes, 440 were alcoholics, and ultimately, they observed that this whole line, this whole family tree, made no helpful contributions to society. And here was the summary of this, this whole article, this whole thing as they were analyzing these two family trees. They said this, how a parent raises their child, the love they give, the values they teach, the emotional environment they offer, the education they provide, influences not only their children, but the four generations to follow, either for good or for bad. So you might not realize it, but you are leaving a legacy. What's the legacy that you want to leave? What is it you want to pour into the next generation? You see, unfortunately, the problem is a lot of us just settle. Don't settle. We're like, I'm good. Things are fine. My, my kids are good. That's, everything is fine. Man. You need to be pouring into your kids, to your grandkids. If you don't have kids or grandkids, you need to be serving. You need to be pouring into other people's kids. Why? Because God's plan extends beyond this generation. God has a plan that extends for generations. And God has a plan for you to be a part of that plan. So we've got to continually be pouring in. Well, today... I want to look in a passage of scripture uh, and look at this kind of legacy that was left. If you'll turn with me first uh, in your Bible, if you have it with you, turn to Joshua chapter 13. So this story begins as the children of Israel, they had just come into the promised land. So they'd gotten out of Egypt, they had crossed through the Red Sea, wandered 40 years, and then crossed into the promised land now. They just defeated Jericho, and they're starting to beat some of these nations. And then listen to what it says. When Joshua was an old man, beginning in verse 1. When Joshua was an old man, the Lord said to him, You are growing old, and much land remains to be conquered. You see, the job was not done. Yes, they had come into the promised land, but they haven't driven out all of the enemies that God had told them to do. And so as they were dividing up the land, each tribe was given a different piece of land. In fact, I've got a map if you want to throw that up real quick. You can see all the different tribes had all different spots. And today we're going to be focusing... Oop, it switched on me. Oh, oh. Now I got all like... There it is. Uh, this tribe right here, the tribe of Dan. So let me tell you a little bit about the tribe of Dan. Dan was one that they were the second largest of all of the tribes at that time. So you had the tribe of Judah was the biggest. They were the baddest. They were like the mega, mega tribe. But then right beside them was the tribe of Dan. And so God had strategically placed the biggest two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Dan, to be at the very bottom of the country right here. Because right along in this spot, you had the Canaanites. Eventually, those would even become the Philistines. We know David, you know, he defeated, defeated the Philistine giant. In fact, right over here, you even see the city of Gath, or uh, right where he's from. 
And so God strategically put Dan and Judah in those two spots. And God told all the tribes, you're supposed to go and defeat your enemies. Push them out. There's just one problem. Dan didn't do the job. Dan was like, ah, it's getting hard. Things are difficult. Yeah, we're, we're coming up against these guys, these Canaanites, and they're difficult. And I don't know about this. I, things are getting hard. And so Dan just kind of stopped. They stopped fighting. They stopped moving forward. And they just kind of like, eh, we'll just settle over here. The problem is there wasn't a lot of space. And they still had these enemies pressing up against them. So let's continue this story. We're going to jump into the book of Judges now. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 1. Now in those days, Israel had no king. And the tribe of Dan was trying to find a place where they could settle. For they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them. Again, because there were all these enemies that they kept coming against. When the, land was, when, the, when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. So the men of Dan chose from their clans five capable warriors from the towns of Zorah and Eshtol to scout out a land for them to settle in. So they couldn't conquer the land that they were supposed to. So they decide on five spies, these five scouts, that are going to go throughout the area and they're going to find a new home for them. Now, let's pause on this story for a second, and I promise we're going to come back. There was living in the land of Ephraim, so right over here is the country, the land of Ephraim, right beside Dan. Right in the land of Ephraim, there was a guy named Micah. Now, this is not the Micah that wrote the book of the Bible called Micah that was the prophet. This is a different Micah. This Micah, he was an Ephraimite. He was living in the hill country, and uh, he actually had created this idol. You see, he had stolen $11,000 worth of silver from his mom back in the day. And then his mom, he heard her talking about the silver. And she even said, man, I'm going to put a curse on whoever stole this silver. And so Micah, he was like, oh my goodness, my mom's about to put this curse on this silver that I just stole. Uh, here, mom, here's this silver. And she's like, okay, we'll take some of this silver. We'll take five pounds of it, and we are going to make an idol. And so Micah, his mom, and his family, they had this small little five-pound statue, this idol that they set up and they worshipped. Now back then, God gave each one of the tribes a different plot of land that they were supposed to live in. They were supposed to conquer and take over. And so you see kind of smattered all around the area, all the different tribes. Now the tribe of Levi... The Levites were the priests in those days. And so God said, I'm actually not going to give the tribe of Levi one plot of land. Instead, I want them to be priests for the entire country, for the entire nation. And so he spread them all out, and he selected different cities that the Levites were supposed to live in. And so you see all the lists. The Levites are supposed to go to this city and this city and this city. And God spread them all out strategically throughout the country so that they could serve as the priests. Well, we're going to dive into the story. We are going to find that there is this one Levite named Jonathan. Now, Jonathan is an interesting guy. He has the best lineage you could ever hope to imagine. Because Jonathan's grandfather is Moses. Like literally, his dad is Moses' oldest son. And according to Jewish tradition, this son of Moses did not really serve God like Moses did. He didn't take like a deep love and compassion for God. He wasn't deep in his studies. And so this son of Moses, Moses was a godly man, but he was not a great father. He is not the person that you want to base your parenting life off of. So Moses' son, Gershom, he really wasn't the greatest influence. And now that has been passed down to this grandson named Jonathan. And so Jonathan is living in the land of Bethlehem, it says. Now what's also interesting is that, remember I told you that the priests, were, the Levites, were supposed to live in all those different select cities all over the land? Bethlehem was not one of the cities that the Levites were supposed to be living in. So already you see that this guy Jonathan is living in a spot that he is not supposed to be living in. Finally, Jonathan, he's like, things are tough in Bethlehem. I'm going to go find a new spot. 
And so he begins to wander around. Eventually, he comes to Ephraim. He comes to Micah's house. He meets Micah. Micah's like, whoa, you're Moses' grandson? Dude, stay here. Live with us. You can be my family's priest. Do we even have this super sweet little five-pound idol? This is going to be fantastic. We got all this priestly garb. Like, we have been hoping someone like you could come and, like, be our little priest. Again, God never wanted a priest in that spot. God had priests in different spots, and the people were supposed to come and serve. Not in this spot either in the city, in the, the land of Ephraim. So now we've kind of set the stage as these five guys from the tribe of Dan, these five scouts, are moving through the land. And now they're going through the land of Ephraim. They're trying to find a new home for them. And now they come to Micah's house. Micah living with Jonathan the priest, the grandson of Moses. So listen with me in Judges chapter 18, verse 3. While at Micah's house, they, meaning the five guys, recognized the young Levite's accent. We're talking about Jonathan here, the priest. So they went over and asked him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? Okay, this is kind of a surreal moment for these guys. These five spies, they're in the middle of nowhere, okay? Like, I'm talking nowhere, like, out in Crescent. Like, that's kind of what we're talking, okay? These guys, they are out, and they're like, Moses' grandson is out in Crescent? Like, are you kidding me? No one's out. How did this happen? And then he shows them, oh, well, I'm set up as the priest here for Micah. We've got this little five-pound statue. Like, this is what we worship. And they're like, okay, well, we're trying to find a new spot for our entire tribe to live. You know, we were thinking of going north. Like, is that where we should go? And he's like, yes, go north. God is going to be with you. And so these five spies, they head north. Now let's head to this next map that I have. They go all the way north, way up here, the very tippy top of the entire country. And they come to this city called Laish. Now, Laish is a small little spot, a uh, real peaceful type of people, and the land is beautiful. In fact, now it's actually a nature preserve, uh, this whole territory in modern-day Israel. And it was beautiful back then as well, this incredible spot. And these people of Laish, uh, they're just living really, really great. Things are going fantastic for them. And these five spies are coming in. They start trying to get some information from them. They're like, so, you know, is there a lot of food here for you? Oh, yes, there's tons of food. Oh, and like, it's easy to farm. Oh, this is great. It is a wonderful spot. Oh, cool. Do you guys have any, like, allies? Like, if you were to be attacked by anyone, you know, when anybody come, nope, just us. Like, we're just, we're just kind of here all alone. I and mean, we got the, the people at Sidon, but they're so far away. Like, it'd take them forever to get to us. Cool, 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 cool. All right, hey. Well, we'll catch you guys later. All right, we're just going to go. And so these five spies, they go back to the tribe of Dan, and they're like, guys, we found it. It's the city of Laish. We're going to move everybody. We're going to go to Laish. This is going to be fantastic. So they gather 600 warriors, and they head out for the town of Laish. Well, as they're moving all the way to go back up to Laish to go defeat those people, they come back to Micah's house. And as they're passing by, those five spies say, Psh, oh, guys, come here, come here, come here, come here. See that house right over there? That's a guy named Micah lives there. And inside, he has this five-pound statue. This, I think we should just take it. And he has all this priestly equipment like Let's just go in and grab it for themselves. So they literally send in some guys. They walk into the house. They grab the statue. They grab all the priestly stuff, and they just start walking on their way. Well, suddenly, Jonathan, Moses' grandson, he sees what's happening. He comes running up, and he's like, whoa, hey, excuse me. Um, that's, that's our stuff. Like, what are you doing? You, you took, you know, our, our idol, and you took all my priestly stuff. Like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, hey, we're actually the tribe of Dan. There's 600 of us. You want to come with us? Like, we need a priest. You're a priest. You're a Levite. Come join us. Like, instead of being a priest for one family, you could be a priest for an entire tribe. And so Jonathan, without hesitation, he's like, okay, 
let's go. And so Jonathan goes with these guys. Well, suddenly Micah, the guy who owned all this and started all this, he sees what's happening, and he comes running up. Oh, whoa, hey, you're taking my priest, my, my idol. You're taking all these priestly things. What gives? And they literally came up to him, and they're like, hey, you need to be quiet or else you're going to regret it. And so Micah, he's like, all right, have a safe trip. And he just kind of backs off. And so these guys continue all the way up to the town of Laish. Now let's pick up again in Scripture and let's see what it reads from there. Beginning in Judges chapter 18, verse 27. Then with Micah's idols and his priest, the men of Dan came to the town of Laish, whose people were peaceful and secure. They attacked with swords and burned the town to the ground. There was no one to rescue the people, for they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. This happened in the valley near Beth Rahab. Then the people of the tribe of Dan rebuilt the town and lived there. They renamed the town Dan after their ancestor Israel's son, but it had originally been called Laish. Then they set up the carved image, and they appointed Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. This family continued as priests for the tribe of Dan until the exile. So Micah's carved image was worshipped by the tribe of Dan as long as the tabernacle of God remained at Shiloh. So here, they move up, they take the land, they set up Jonathan as this wicked priest, and they all begin to serve this idol. Now the tribe of Dan is one that over and over and over again was looking for the easy way out. This was not a clan of amazing people. In fact, earlier in the book of Judges, you see Deborah. And Deborah, she's this uh, one of the first judges. She calls the whole nation. She says, hey, we've got to go attack our enemies. Who's coming with me? And the tribe of Dan doesn't join. And so she writes this song. And in the song, she literally says, where were you, Dan? We called and you didn't come to help. You hung out in your boats. And then years later, you see Samson. He was the most famous guy from the tribe of Dan. Again, not a winner. I know a lot of times we think, no, he was strong. He did all those great things. No, he was a terrible human being. Like he is not the guy you want to base your life around. He did good stuff. God worked in spite of his failings, not because of all those things. Samson is not a person you want to base your life on. And so this is the lineage of the tribe of Dan. You see people who have not been faithfully serving God. And now they move to a spot where they're not supposed to be. They've got this idol and they've got this false priest. And they're trying to serve God up in this place. Years later, they would actually have this civil war between the nation of Israel. And it divided into two countries. And the northern kingdom split off from the southern kingdom of Judah And in the northern kingdom, the guy who was leading over it, Jeroboam, he actually set up two places in his kingdom where the people would worship this golden calf. And one of those places was the town of Dan. Right where they had set up that little five-pound idol, they said, hey, we'll just put the five-pound idol away and we'll set up this giant golden calf. And now we'll worship here. They had already been training generations to worship other gods. And then, eventually, years later, you see the exile as the Assyrians begin to move through the land. And the very first town they came from the north, the very first tribe that they would have defeated as they're marching all the way through was the tribe of Dan. So what are the things that we should learn from the tribe of Dan? I believe there are three things that God wants us to learn here today. The first thing is don't ignore where God tells you to go. God might be speaking to you or he has spoken to you. Hey, I want you to do this. I want you to go to that person. I want you to get this job. I want you to to follow this path, this plan. But so many times we settle and we say, nah, I'm good. I just want to, it's comfortable here. I I don't want to go and do that hard thing that you told me to do. The problem is, is that when we don't go where God wants us to go, we end up somewhere that God never intended for us to be. God never intended the tribe of Dan to be in the north. He intended them to be in the south. He intended them to beat the Philistines and to be a part of that brick wall on the south. But they didn't fulfill that calling that God had for them. 
Why? Because they weren't willing to go where God said to go. When God speaks to you, you need to go. Now, some of you, you may be looking at yourself and you say, Pastor Jeremy, God did speak to me and I did say no. Well, guess what? It's never too late to still say yes. It's never too late to say, okay, God, you want me to do this? I am going to do this. How awesome would it have been? How incredibly awesome if generations later the tribe of Dan had said, you know what? Let's go back. Let's finish the work that our families never did. Let's go out and defeat those enemies, and we're going to show them what the tribe of Dan is really made of. You think God would have honored that? Absolutely. I was talking to a guy recently, and he was telling me, he said, Pastor Jeremy, I, I, I feel like I was supposed to go into ministry, and I just didn't obey that calling years ago. And I'm like, well, what's stopping you now? Do it now. And he's literally about to jump into Bible classes. He's retired, but he's like, I am still going to do the work that God, even though I said no before, I'm going to say yes to what God has for me. You need to go where God wants you to go. There's a second lesson, though, that I believe we have from this story. Don't carry things God never wanted you to carry. As the tribe of Dan was going through, what was the thing that they picked up with them? That idol, that silver idol. And they're like, let's take this with us. And so many times we do the same thing. Now, it may not be an idol that we're picking up. Instead, we're going and we're saying, you know what? I'm going to pick up this anger, this bitterness. I'm going to, ooh, I'm going to carry this. And this is going to come with me. You know what? I'm going to pick up fear and anxiety. These two, they're going to travel with me. Yep, come on, let's go. Let's go over here. God never told you to pick those things up. So why are you picking up something that got a burden that God never wanted you to carry in the first place? Don't carry those things that God doesn't want you to carry. But there's a third lesson I believe that we also have from this story. Don't invite the wrong people into your life. This tribe was real quick to invite Jonathan, this wicked priest, into their life. On paper, he was the real deal. I mean, on paper, this guy is a great hire. This is a no-brainer. The problem is, is his life did not reflect what all of his credentials showed. And so many times, we do the same thing. We allow people to influence our lives. We pull them in into places that we never should. And some of you, you may even be saying, well, Pastor Jeremy, that's, it's my family you're honestly talking about. Like, my family isn't serving God. Like, I'm not going to cut your family out. Look, here's the deal. I'm not saying you have to completely cut your family out. But I am saying you don't want your family to be the main influence on your kids' lives if your family's not serving God. Amen. I literally was talking to someone this past Wednesday. And uh, this mom came up to me and she said, what do I do? I, I live with my father and he watches all these terrible pornographic shows in front of my two-year-old. What should I do? And I'm like, time to move out. She's like, well, yeah, but it's my dad. And I'm like, that's not an influence that you want. I don't care if it's your dad. You don't want that influence on your children. You have got to take the step forward. I was talking to another guy that uh, he's got guys, these buddies. They're not bad guys. Like, they're not doing bad stuff. But they're not challenging him and pushing him deeper in his walk with God. They've just kind of all settled together. The people that you need in your life are the people that are going to push you forward. They're going to say, hey, you need to go deeper and further. God's got more for you. That are going to challenge you to take new ground from the enemy. Those are the people that you want in your life. You know, as I look in this story of the tribe of Dan, the thing that's the most heartbreaking is when you skip to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and God, he's talking about all the people that he saved for himself. And literally, he says, I've saved 144,000 that are going to be following me. And he lists all the tribes that this 144,000 are coming from. 12,000 from the tribe of, of Judah. 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin. 12, and he lists all the tribes. But there's one tribe that he leaves out. He leaves out the tribe of Dan. 
He literally, eventually you see that Joseph, his family was kind of divided into two tribes. And so as it lists the tribes, it lists Joseph's two sons. But it doesn't mention anything about the tribe of Dan. Why? Because God said, this family is so wicked. This family does not serve me. It is generations and generations upon generations of wickedness and idolatry that I am going to cut them out of my plan. And that is heartbreaking. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be cut out of God's plan. I want to be right in the middle, in the center of God's plan. I want to go where God tells me to go. I only want to bring the things that God wants me to bring. I only want to have the people in my life that God wants surrounding in my life. I want to be right in the will of what God has for me. And when you do those things, I promise you, you will leave a legacy that extends beyond you, beyond your children, that will extend even beyond four generations. You will have generations upon generations that look and they say, man, my great-great-grandmother, my great-great-grandfather, they were righteous. They served God. Now, some of you, you may look at your life and you may say, I don't have a great lineage. I look at my family tree And it looks a lot more like Max Jukes than it did Jonathan Edwards. It's a bunch of losers, people who weren't serving God. What if you're the person that God wants to use to transform all the generations to follow? What if you're the one that begins this new line that says no longer will our family be known as drunks? No longer is alcohol going to rage through our family and destroy marriages. No longer are we going to be known as a family filled with divorce. No longer is hatred and anger going to be a problem that we struggle with. No longer is unforgiveness going to be something that's passed down from generation to generation. No longer are we going to be a family that's absorbed with greed and how we can get more and more and more. No, what if you're willing to say, I want to step forward and I want to change things, not just for me, but for all the generations to follow. All across this room, would you bow your heads with me? Because I know in this room, there's some of you that you may look at your own life and you may say, Pastor Jeremy, I am not living the life that God has called out for me. And if you are super honest with yourself, the legacy that you are leaving What you've put into other generations is not the legacy you want to be known for. And today, God wants to change that legacy. Thank you for joining us online today. Make sure and hit subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for more notifications. We can't wait to engage with you this week.